Good evening. I'm just going to say a few words of introduction to Alex's lecture tonight. Um, and just remember that we started talking to Alex about a year ago, and when we first approached him, I do distinctly remember saying to the, word, the words to Alex, why don't you show a nice video, something quite simple, something quite straightforward, um, which he didn't choose to do. Um, so we've got the most amazingly um, elaborate, beautiful structure now in the front members' room, which has used so much technology, it's just mind-boggling, but um, quite amazing. Um, I don't know if you know, any of you remember when he transformed the bar. I mean, we should have had some warning that nothing Alex does is straightforward. Two years ago, he transformed the AA bar with the help of Mike Smith from Mike Smith Studios, and he built this amazing, huge structure out of cardboard. So basically, when you walked into the AA bar, you be began to climb up a series of huge cardboard steps until you were towering above the bar, which is a great opportunity because our barman is really tall. So suddenly you were there kind of leaning over him in the espresso machine, which was thrilling and scary at the same time. And the opening night, we had the Swiss ambassador came, and I was so convinced he was going to fall to his death from the top of one of these cardboard structures. But he just looked at me and said, my dear, Switzerland is a mountainous country. And he was, he was off. He was fine. I think the great thing um, for us about Alex's interventions is that we're so familiar with the A building. It's, we're here so often and such long hours, I, I sometimes think we live here and I forget that we actually have homes and lives. So to transform the space is, is great, to see it used in a different way, like the bar which suddenly became this vertiginous, scary structure. Um, the great thing as well is that they kind of divide opinion. The bar terrified some people. People that were used to ordering their latte in the morning suddenly wouldn't set foot in it and had to shout their orders from the corner of the room. And I was speaking to someone about it today and she said to me, oh, some people are just scared of change. I think with that, people are just scared of heights. Um, this exhibition now is done with a cast of thousands. So I wanted to say thank you to everybody that's helped make it possible. Um, Alex actually has um, starred in a film, acted in a film, um, and so I guess he's used to a cast of thousands, so when it came to doing this exhibition, he kind of recreated the feeling of a, of a film. Um, it's, a, it's really nice for us to see all the activity in the AA is, is bought, it's, it's invisible activity, it's a maze, the AA, all this stuff goes on, and you're kind of not aware of the different rooms, the different spaces that are used. Lighthive brings it all to one space so you can see how the building is used. But I wanted to say a big thanks to his sponsors, and it really wouldn't have been possible without them. Um, first to Zimtobel for the, the huge sponsorship and the support they've given us, Steve Edwards at Zimtobel. Arfon Davis at Arabs Lighting, who started working a year ago with us and has helped enormously and always been calm which is just amazing. So thank you, Arfon. Stuart Langdon at Tridonic, Faros, big thanks to Nick, Archdale, Richard Mead, and Simon Hicks, who also is another calm genius, who never looked flustered. Lawrence Griffiths at AVEC, and I think we're really going to miss you, Lawrence. Maybe you could stay for a bit longer. Um, Stephen Hayes at Interior Automation, Mark Fawns, the very many, for those amazingly complex drawings. I don't know how your mind is feeling right now. But. Carsten Gebert for Linux Coding, Engineering by Ben Godberg. Gosh, it does sound like a sort of Oscar thanks, so sorry about that. Amy Bank Takaru and the lovely Kyo, the lovely and funny Kyo. But thank you for everybody that's worked on it. It's been an experience. So here's Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, and of course, thank you more than anyone to you, Vanessa, for telling lies and pretending that it was actually my choice and it was your choice. I said, why don't we just cut a little strip in the floor and rain in into it? It was so simple. It was just like 30 <laughs> centimetres wide, a metre long. That's my suggestion. And you said, no, go for the whole building installation. So <laughs> I'm sorry you brought it upon yourself. But anyway, thank you for all of your help throughout this. And I reiterate everyone... You know, um, Thank you to all of you for your magnificent input. I really felt I'm going to show you lots of pictures here. It's going to be just like the project. It's going to be a bit of a nightmare sitting through this, and it's going to be intensely repetitive and very, very mundane. So uh, I hope you'll stay with me. But uh, I'm not in it because, in a way, I felt like I never really was. I was just watching this amazing hive of activity, and it was kind of a little bit like a preface to the actual project itself. You know, the people just kind of came in from every corner of the room, the world, you know, it was really amazing and completely inspiring as well. It was very interesting actually gender-wise because we had this very male team that was very 
football-y and beery in, in the day and, and, and very good and very strong, but we had this incredibly sensitive and incredibly productive female team that took over at six o'clock in the evening, who lasted absolutely forever, probably did about twice as much work. I mean, I'm, you know, Lawrence, I can see you there. You, were, you straddled both somehow. You were kind of tranny, you know, it was great. Um, <laughs> anyway, I've got a couple of programs here running at once and I can't see anything on my screen, so um, I've also kind of haven't slept for a long time and I hear that um, you get you complete short-term memory loss when you don't sleep, so I can't even remember what's first in my slideshow, so please forgive me. What I was going to do is show you very quickly some kind of very schematic projects that I've done that kind of in some way relate to this to sort of try and uh, emphasize the kind of ongoing interest in I suppose, opticality, theatricality, paranoia, behavior, people-generated space, chaos, those kind of things. So uh, I guess uh, what I thought I would do, given that the handout is quite explicit about the opening night not really mattering, the closing night being the thing that actually, let's see if we can get a performance on the opening night and watch the log, watch the communal activity. It's still not happening, right? Um, let's see if we can get that log feeding back into the space and actually watch the shape of time, a complete month. So given that we haven't really got animation yet, given that Vanessa did describe it, it's such a shame as a structure as opposed to a mechanism or a system or something that actually operated in some way. It wasn't completely static. Everyone sees it as a chandelier and says, how oh, it's nice and walks out. Uh, I thought I would start with something animated, just sort of tease and promise, you know, the, the animation to come when eventually we get the damn thing working. Um, so maybe I will start with uh, a little piece of music. Um, this was... Uh, a tiny little kind of experiment um, that kind of repeats my uh, interest in the musicality of architecture and the kind of rhythms and structures that allow animation to happen in kind of everyday life. And I was really interested at one point, I mean, I was very close to leaving architecture. Uh, I was really interested in the work of Michel Gondry, and uh, this is, I guess, a kind of tribute to, I don't know if we've got any sound here. This is just a kind of little analysis of a piece of work that he did. of movie making is that it's simply a reading of time into space. There's a, a motion capture rig running around this little street corner in Paris that I sort of looked up like a complete nerd. It's really insane, but I, I found maps and actually retraced exactly where they placed the motion camera. Uh, I found some, actually there's a lovely little bit here, let me see if I can get it, uh, which is in, in a clip which is the making of, which is, I, I can't believe that they included this because I have a massive interest in accident and this is quite literally accident. Here's the motion capture rig. Uh, gonna go around. I don't know, it's a very, very bad photo because it's never the back of the DVD. They actually put this on the DVD, look at that. They actually hit the guy holding the light. I love it. Isn't it amazing that they actually include this kind of moment of violence? But anyway, what I was interested in teasing out here is all these little moments of error, because obviously this whole thing is digitized. So all these little moments of little collisions here where you can see Kylie running into herself or we've got these sort of ghost impossibilities and there's quite a few of them kind of carry through. Anyway, there's this kind of absurd uh, uber analysis that kind of runs through at the same time as this kind of lavish um, enjoyment of uh, form, I suppose. So that kind of was kind of quite explicitly echoed by a project that was the last thing I ever did as a student. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know why I can't... Uh, which was an analysis of... No, it's not coming up, sorry. Why won't it do that? Ah, that's weird. Sorry. 
Um, it was an analysis of a piece of music and an attempt to actually generate a piece of architecture from a 26-track piece of trance. So that was, in a way, my code for generating this space. What you see down here is the amplitude, which was my code. If, you, if that was my code for program and plan, that was my code for sector. So it started to generate a sort of field. I was very interested in sort of political intrigue that took place in repressed spaces, which carries through to the next project and in a way sustains itself through to here too. The idea was that there were sort of two twin sites, the actual space and the music itself, and the idea always of unpeeling the surface and revealing something. So similarly, this project, which uh, owes many thanks to a guy I think I saw in the back called Aram, there you are, who also worked on this project, did a great job. Uh, this was trying to deal with the repressed real estate of the desk, you know, the desk has two surfaces and we don't tend to care about the underside of it at all. I thought that this is a massive corporate waste of uh, opportunity and we could be in fact hanging supine workers uh, underneath it uh, who would be resting gently so that they could get back to work as soon as possible. So the idea was that this is a competition for um, a project which obviously never won anything, um, but the idea was to generate a landscape which you could occupy on two sides and uh, enjoy the underside of it as this kind of slumber space, because frankly everyone obviously sleeps at the office, you go to the office to actually have fun anyway, don't you? Probably, probably more efficient at home. Um, but the idea was also that there was always a, a certain element of kind of uh, discomfort, you know, like working out or like going to the club, these things can be unpleasant at the same time. So there was acupuncture built into the inflatable kind of mattress which was customized to your body, the sort of instruments that kind of offered you technology on one side, offered it to you on the other side. Uh, here's Aram kind of resting slowly on the other side, turning himself upside down, and then his clone comes in and works on top of him. There he is resting, and there all the little clones are underneath. Uh, similarly, this kind of project was about mirroring, and as you can see, there's a mirror upstairs, so there's kind of continuity here, I guess. A one day installation in a Viennese bar, simple little cameras and uh, TV playing back what's happening on the bar itself with progressive, just very, very kind of gimmicky, but progressive out of focus use of the lens itself. So as you moved along the bar and got steadily drunker, the kind of image steadily kind of went out of focus. You saw your mirror image, you were sort of slowly confused. There was this kind of immense feedback, meant to be sort of slight kind of comment. And this is what Vanessa was um, referring to the kind of uh, topography in the bar. Um, what I found important in this that connects back to this too is you can see there's a TV there embedded in one of those things. What those TVs were relaying was buttocks, which are an important part of this project too, because there were little cameras inside some of these cells that were recording you as you sat down on them. So every act of sitting and occupying this structure actually occluded the light that would be offered somewhere else. So you'd be sitting next to this kind of glowing box and then suddenly it went off. You knew that someone had sat down elsewhere. So I quite like this sort of connectivity. And that is an integral part of this project. Thanks to Lawrence, who uh, shares my buttock fetish. He's distributed chair sensors throughout the building, uh, on some willingly, some unwittingly, perhaps. Uh, we don't... <laughs> I'm not sure who knows where they they all are and how long they'll stay there and how long we'll keep recording the buttocks. But uh, that's part of the integral system for actually detecting what actually happens in, in this space. Uh, so some more final images of how people actually walked across. Uh, this goes back again, uh, an occupiable structure like the kind of piece of furniture we saw before. Um, it's a brief collaborative project I did with a woman called, sorry, Caff uh, Matthews with programming by David Moot. Uh, uh, called Music for Bodies, and again, it's about this performative aspect of architecture, its ability to induce rhythms. Here, the music is actually felt and tactile, rather than uh, simply oral audio. So here we are at this space here. Uh, when Vanessa suggested an exhibition, I'd always found the kind of facade somehow under-curated, a little bit under-exploited, and the idea that the kind of biggest exhibition space in the whole school was actually there in these large windows and nothing ever happened. I always approached it, I always saw loads of light coming out of it, but I never saw anything happening. And I thought that was a sort of great opportunity and started looking around at how light was used in this building. Uh, 
you can see in this room itself, the sort of weird eccentricity. The light has a massively political effect in this room because, of course, we're kind of piercing the membrane that acoustically steals us from the most quiet. The loudest room, in, maybe apart from the workshop, is underneath the quietest room. So I should probably play the music a lot louder. I'm sorry that I'm not exploiting that opportunity more. But I, I saw, in a way, a kind of massive, not just formal resemblance between the light, um, but... Um, the fact that light always illuminates, it's the sort of grand um, eye, all-seeing eye that uh, allows surveillance to happen. So of course, every time there's light, there's activity, but there's also watchfulness. And there's this ongoing interest always in the sort of ever-increasing um, state of surveillance that we live in, which of course is an immensely hackneyed discourse has been going on forever. Everyone's been looking at it. Uh, these images crowd our papers every day. It's amazing that we've sort of substituted Magnum for a kind of 320 by 240 or whatever. Um, it's amazing the kind of amount of paranoia here about people thinking that this is a digitized image, kind of checking it over, you know, claiming this guy's got a half leg. It's amazing the way that these things are sort of so uh, discursed upon. Uh, I love this. I came back on Monday from Sweden and it says this hall is CCTV monitored in Stansted, but it said there are no cameras which I loved, which I, it reminds me of a moment when I was in New York in a, in a um, what was it called, a court uh, for, dr you're not allowed to drink in public in America, it's one of those things. And uh, there was a sign that said no reading, so I was kind of befuddled as to how on earth you could actually read the sign. But anyway, uh, it kind of continues this ongoing project I've kind of published here in the school before about things like the idealized state of surveillance, the, the supposed panoptic model, which of course is false. You know, this is a simple image of the blind spot itself. So there's always this sense of resistance to the model of surveillance and also um, the sense that if we all know this section of the panopticon, few of us know this one, which is the imprisoning section of the panopticon, the kind of shroud. This is buried deep in the Bentham files that the uh, panoptic guard was meant to wear, imprisoned there, unable to move in his helmet, in his cloak, in his clothing. And that is, of course, most CCTV operatives are there, stuck, you know. Some of them, uh, there's been a lot of papers about how disabled they are. So there's always this sort of flip side. And part of this project is also, of course, trying to glean enjoyment from surveillance. Uh, these are people going out on the streets in New York, surveillance camera players plotting every single camera on the street, other people kind of perform to the cameras, and always the enjoyment of the anti-surveillance move. This is an artist called Michael Neymar who discovered that you can destroy CCTV cameras with a little red laser pen. So that's the image you get there, the sort of productive use of light on a kind of mechanism that actually produces light. And of course, this is the panopticon, this is the kind of sun, this is so many things, this globe that we see throughout the school. I started to look at the lights and uh, there's a woman, I don't know if she's here, Kelly Opie, who uh, helped me massively with a survey of every single light in this school, 1,027 of them. We mapped every single type, uh, every single wattage. We put it on a spreadsheet. I've lost it. I don't know where it is. But we kind of <laughs> knew exactly where all the energy was being expended. Funnily enough, we expended down here, kind of upstairs. We don't tend to, you know, in the smaller rooms with all our fluorescent. Because it's generally very warm down here. I don't know if you think heat rises, but actually our kind of thermal light actually sinks. Um, so the project was also intended through these windows, through its use of that space up above, um, to in some way address this new bit of um, urban furniture we've got, this platform, this crazy piece of little tarmac that we never use, that we don't do anything with. Um, and it was intended that somehow we could actually sort of project more signals of what we are doing. Uh, so let's just see if we ever get there. Uh, also, of course, it was intended to operate across a range of scales. If that's the urban section up at the top, and then we've got the kind of more local section across Bedford Square, and then, of course, the section within the space itself. Um, these are going to be various images which try to explain how the project actually works. Simply put, I just compress the whole school into that room. That's it. It's nothing kind of uh, complicated. Uh, it's just one to six. That's what fit best so that you can walk around the sides. Uh, does one to five matter? No, I actually I, I kind of wrote a little brief piece in the handout. I found this idea of six quite interesting because, of course, it's our temporal unit. But it has happened to kind of come up in again and again and again in this project. Very strange. So the light diffusers that I'll come on to, and Mark Form is here, who did a massive amount of brilliant work on it. Uh, again, a scale of six reduced down from this. So if these are the plans of the school in their correct orientation, so if that 
white cube there is the room itself, then reference back into the room that we're actually in. Uh, if these are the plans with their actual light sources, then these are the light sources in space, and that's the project. That's it. You know, nothing complicated, really. Honest. <laughs> that's how <laughs> we got it started, anyway. Um, and so, a few more images of that. You can see this floral motif up there. The idea was that, in some way, it would continue to be a kind of chandelier of some sort. It would continue to be a kind of drop-down feature, because uh, absolutely magnificent that thing that hangs there. Of course causes massive amount of pain because a hanging project cannot touch the thing it hangs from. So that is the only listed thing in the whole building. In fact, we found out later that we happen to have the most expensive thing in the whole building in the center, not just in plan, but in section, hanging down with trying to wield kind of huge scaffolding cranes around it. That thing was valued, that chandelier apparently, and we, we, we were endlessly debating this, <laughs> and we were really bored because everyone kept telling us this every day, but it was was valued in 1972 at 35 grand. So if anyone wants to nick up their little kind of crystal, I don't know if we'll ever notice, but you would make a lot of money, apparently. Um, so more images of the thing, view from the bar, uh, the idea, this sort of obsession about the particulate cloud slightly, the idea of these kind of fragments, this kind of new climate. This is showing it with a mirrored ceiling, so suddenly we get this huge expansion. The thing becomes as high as it is actually long. It's eight meters by six meters and it becomes eight meters high. You can hardly see the chandelier here. All you're seeing in this image is the light that you cast by being there. So it's completely like the uncertainty theory, Heisenberg, you know, as soon as you intrude, as soon as you look, you create, you contaminate. Uh, there's no other light on because you are the only person in the building. But here we have people in the lecture hall. So uh, there's two sources and now you start to see the reflection up above and you start to see it glinting off of the chandelier and then it kind of goes on. So that's it at about 25% occupancy. Uh, and that's the image if you had see-through walls of what you'd actually see as you went out. And then hopefully, you know, at very early stages we didn't really know what light source it would be, speculating on what kind of holocaustic explosions we could sort of get out of here. What was interesting is that we went through a series of kind of thoughts about what kind of light source we could actually use and we discovered that 1027, if we just use a standard light bulb, we would blow up the building because it just could not take it. So we were really forced down the kind of contemporary route of lighting design of LEDs. So that's the room with the chandelier in it, the floor plans, the cables hanging. Uh, there was a moment at which there was a sort of slight formal tendency to actually try and generate something from the kind of uh, leftover splines of the connections between the plans, but that didn't happen. Good. Uh, so here are the particles themselves. Uh, the very, very beginning of the spreadsheet, which became immensely long uh, and just be too boring to show here. What was interesting is that there was a lot of accounting throughout this project. There was a huge amount of Excel. My eyes were definitely square for weeks on end. And what I didn't realize for quite a long time, really embarrassing, I always thought this was a five-story building. But I didn't realize that there's this extra little plan. It's like being John Malkovich. There's a sort of half floor. And that's the accounts office. Now, the irony of spending all my time in Excel, and I miss all the guys in there who work on Excel the whole time. I love this. That's the accounts office. And I didn't even notice them, because there is this little floor. You've got to ask for it, especially if you want to get the extra, well, it's the one and a half floor. But there they are. Now, unfortunately, they're not represented. <laughs> so they can get on with their work. But we don't know whether they're making money for us or not. You know, we don't know how well they're doing their job because they're not included. So they're a kind of blind spot, unfortunately. You know, surveillance, panopticon, you know, keeps on going. These are the zones of the building going from basement, ground, first, second, third, up. This is the network that we were originally thinking of and we were sweating quite profusely at this point when we were thinking about the miles of cable that we were going to have to run from every single room, you know, throughout the whole building in order to get back to the central space. You can see that as these lines accumulate and get thicker and kind of stretch back, you, you, you know, we're talking about a bunch of cables that thick, you know, something really like a tree in order to get back to the room. So it became quite important to try and find a, a sensing solution that this is the zones with the lights starting to overlay so you can zoom in and see the kind of amount of detail we had to go into in the mapping. But it became quite important to try and find a network solution that wasn't so kind of retarded as you know, the typical architect's thought of kind of branching structure. It looks beautiful, great. Um, so we started to think about also how we would sense throughout the building and this kind of related, this is a tiny photo uh, of an installation my unit did recently with Martina in the event gallery. 
Um, we've been looking at sensors slightly, but these are different kind of sensors. The initial dream was really to use as many cameras as possible. There was some kind of dumb idea I had that Sony would just kind of give me a box or something uh, and then so with the red field here is kind of all optically kind of filtered uh, we do have cameras we have five and the genius called Carsten has found a way to kind of dissect these cameras I'll take you through that later but uh, here we were I was hoping for about 50 and then all the rest of it was apportioned to passive infrared detectors so later on our solution became to use the uh, remote input-output modules offered by Faros Architectural Controls have played a completely leading role in this. Very, very important. They're kind of providing the base infrastructure. They, their stuff plugs into the Ethernet and we kind of take our feeds locally, like little hubs and nodes. So it's still uh, operating on PARs, but here you can start to see the in-ocean equipment appear. This is Lawrence's gig, so it's the wireless stuff. He's given me this little thing here. Uh, which uh, doesn't, there's no battery here involved. Uh, there's meant to be some little LEDs coming on. But this is all about kind of harvesting light. This is, these have solar cells or else they generate light from just simple kinetic energy like a kind of piezo, but I don't think it is a piezo, but he can, he's not, he's shaking his head, it's not. Thing. Um, but the, this stuff is either in chairs or it's in doors, you know, it's a bit of a problem in bathrooms. What do you do? You can't really look at people in bathrooms and you don't really want to, you know, well, I mean, you do want to, but you can't. Uh, uh, and so we use doors to just check whether or not they're kind of going in and out or not. So just trundling through the various plans there, you'll see these things distributed throughout the building. Um, these are the remote input output modules taking in all the little feeds from all the different zones buried around. These are mercury uh, motion detectors versus the BEG occupancy detectors, which look thrillingly panoptic, really, don't they? Uh, radially all-encompassing, completely ensnaring. There's no way you're going to escape them, the all-seeing eyes. And uh, I love the nomenclature here, slave, written everywhere. And of course, they are in the bathroom. They have no embarrassment about this whatsoever. You know, all those cubicles fully covered there. Um, but we do have wire unfortunately we are not the kind of pristine wireless solution that we'd love to be uh, you know a purely an ocean based thing would be absolutely wonderful there's some literature out there on this sensing equipment because it's absolutely amazing um, so you'll see these PIRs kind of poking their weird heads everywhere I mean they're great but uh, but funny I suppose uh, and you'll see wires everywhere. That's, uh, by contrast, the uh, receiver or repeater in the stairway, which is picking up the wireless signals elsewhere. I love the picture here, how happy we are with wireless, that we can pass through walls as a little smiley face to you know, ensure that you can actually get the signal through. That's the door magnet that you'll see distributed around, and that's the stuff that you get within. This all relies heavily on equipment which has been graciously donated by Stephen Hayes from Interior Automation. That stuff's upstairs right next to the LPC. And this is Karsten's script that he started writing in order to kind of dissect the various cameras that have been distributed around. So, I mean, I think uh, the cameras, that, I mean, We've been struggling hugely with this whole network. Um, on Friday when we opened, uh, we discovered that the network is actually as sort of antiquated as the brickwork, uh, that it's just kind of crumbling and falling apart. And, uh, you know, it's, it feels a little bit like cats or something. That, you know, you think they're, they're young, but actually they're old for what they are. And that's essentially what it is. So they've been kind of tr acceleratingly trying to replace as much of it as possible. Seems to be kind of going on and off, but uh, on one of these uh, web pages, you can actually check, see, uh, is it F5? We can just check what's happening in the computer room so we can just sort of get a constant update. This stuff all feeds to the web page, so if you guys really wanted to, I get, you can just see it on the web page anyway. But I think this is this room here, so uh, yeah, and should we see if this one works? I think with this field image, I mean, you guys aren't moving very much. Can't you wave or something? Can someone wave just so we can see if it actually works? Mm, <laughs> uh, yes, it does. Okay, great. So that um, is then being filtered by, I hope I can get my slideshow back, um, by Carsten's zones. He's using a piece of software called Zone Minder, so he's kind of dissecting those zones and detecting activity in each kind of position as soon as someone gets up they then trigger the little light it's actually in their space uh, and this is the feral stuff which I'm gonna I, I've actually got running I hope um, so there's just some brief images here of the kind of stuff that I'm hoping to actually be able to run so 
here you can see that this is all the various areas of the school with their corresponding dimmers and DMX channels. What we actually ended up with is 1,027 lights. Um, we had a maximum of uh, six lights per circuit because of the software that we were given by Tridonic, which is amazing software. We're very, very grateful. Tridonic are the partner to Zimtabel, who have been the kind of key sponsor that have driven this whole thing forward from the very beginning, thanks to Arfin's introduction. Uh, Zimtabel are the ones that are ultimately responsible for the lights, the delivery of that. So they've been working in close conjunction with the kind of net, uh, the, the general system of dimming that Tridonic have been providing. Uh, that's all re referenced here. Um, where was I going to go? I was going to go to simulate, wasn't I? And then this is the life of a student in the AA. These are all the plans, and hopefully, if I press start, is that right? Where's the student? <laughs> Ground floor. Are they? I don't see them. It's holiday. <laughs> Where do you think they might be? Do I need to? I don't do output live. It's working. I might be just being impatient. <laughs> just the Emperor's new student. <laughs> Where is the student? I'm sorry, I don't see him. Lighting up white. Point. Where, where shall I go? <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> uh, but I really can't see an activity here. Anyway, supposedly, what well, the idea was really that, w as a demonstration principle, we could actually show you what it would be like to. D oh, are they there? The elusive student is on the stair. I love it. Oh, there they are. I see. Yes, in the basement now. So there they are in the intermediate units there kind of, they're growing up slowly. They're kind of, they've done foundation, they've done first year, so they're now growing up, because the idea is that they ultimately become chairman, you see. They go through diploma, then they do PhD, then they leave for a long time, and then they come back and become chairman. Uh, but that was going to contrast with the kind of uh, day in the life of a school as a playback to kind of compare with the actual um, real live stuff. So that's an introduction, very bad one, sorry, to Faris's equipment. Um, and they are absolutely key in making all of this happen. They're taking all the information, collecting it together from in ocean, from the cameras and playing it back. So just thought I'd show you very quickly the uh, very, very early schematic thoughts we had about how to actually light this space. You know, of course, the top left, we just thought of bulbs. Uh, or make bulbs that look like bulbs, or crosses, or diffusers, or any, any other thing, or things that are just fluorescent, or electroluminescent cable, or should we make some chandeliers of some sort? Came up with this design, this is Steve Edwards from Zimtabel, uh, of very, very basic kind of laser cut pieces which would sit around an LED, a tiny micro 1.2 watt, beautifully super bright, it comes in a variety of temperatures, LED, with a little heat sink, clasping around it like a little piece of Japanese carpentry, diffusing to various points. We had long discussions. Uh, those are very early prototypes, little problems of kind of breakages and so on. Then later thoughts about cable ties or uh, should we actually use the hooks of the diffusers to kind of hold the cables in? Uh, thinking about its parametric shift, because the idea is were that these prongs were defining the rooms that they were sourced from. So I was thinking in my kind of lame way, two-dimensionally, how I would actually draw these things and sort of fence stretch them in microstation so that you know, it was easier for me to do. Uh, here's the final kind of design that came through in prototype form. Little oval ring there, interesting, looks very minor. Uh, turns out that it would cost about, I think, is it a thousand euros to provide all of those in clear, but it cost about four quid to make them in black, so we got black upstairs instead. Uh, so earlier diffusers, and then the final kind of design, kind of before we started introducing the wonder of Mark Fawn, uh, color temperatures. Uh, here's the original parameters that w I was trying to set out that would compare an incandescent. These things came in pairs, but compare an incandescent to, for instance, a fluorescent, uh, or here a halogen. Um, it was all about the kind of fall-off diagram, essentially, of how light spread from these sources. So it was trying to be faithful to the idea of what the geometry of the room is like and what the actual essence of the light source is like as well. 
Um, so, of course, with fluorescent, you're getting a more round, diffused glow with halogen. It's much more acute and uh, pointed. Uh, so these are, uh, and we had a whole range of sources from monitors, desk lamps, projectors as well. So all of that fed into a conversation I started having with Mark, uh, thanks to Diego Rosales. Um, I, I, I chatted to Mark about whether or not there'd be a possibility to run a script with a model of the school that would automatically develop the shapes of all of these pieces, uh, given these various sort of parametric logics. Uh, I, I've never scripted in my life, I'm sure I never will. And uh, Mark is kind of the ace of Rhino scripting. So uh, we kind of developed it slowly over time and he, uh, well actually he was incredibly quick. Um, here are various sketches, you can see his blog, it's the very many, uh, dot net. I don't know, but if you just type in the very many you'll get it. And you can see these kind of very, very compelling uh, formations coming out where this diffuser, what it's trying to do, the simple rule is that the way you register light is transitions. You see how light uh, changes in its tone across the surface. You don't sort of, you see, you don't really register diffuse spread or fall off across the surface. What you register is a kind of abrupt shift. So what this is doing is a little monster kind of going out to find transitions in spaces. So we modeled the whole school, not just the walls and floor ceilings, but the windows, the doors, and every piece of furniture, just in a very crude schematic way. So these light sources, when once fed into them, as kind of little points would then search out with their prongs all the different transition points. So there's our model of the school, then all the various prongs stretching out. Um, and the script kind of was asked to do quite a lot of things like actually fill it at corners, um, label all the individual pieces, unroll them from the three-dimensional model, um, lay them out flat. And uh, th this just gives you an idea of uh, you know the sort of complexity of some of these kind of pieces as they were. Th that's the first unroll of a very, very simple version. Here's a cluster of them all hanging in space. Here's, I think, eight pages that we ended up exporting into one by one and a half meter perspex panels that ended up being transported here. Um, they required some revision in 2D, so uh, this is kind of where the team started expanding into people that came from all reaches. This is they, them all overlaid. You start to sense the differentiation, and that's, uh, again, those eight sheets overlaid in totality. Here's a Saturday morning in the studio with everyone helping out suddenly crafting these pieces. And this was the kind of one of the first stages of Mark's kind of um, attitude was let's try and avoid s cyber grit, let's be pure, let's try and do this as cleanly as possible. Here's us kind of getting personality back into handcrafting because you know that's what it is essentially really. But you will use a computer as a tool. Um, we're making these things individually. It was just quite amazing to see how <laughs> everyone's individual interpretation of those pieces kind of actually was quite distinct. You know, you could really almost read again like a pet, kind of the individual version. So one of the guys was this guy, and his pieces looked like monsters. Really, they looked like this. He had some kind of natural tendency to make them kind of facially. This is Aram again, the guy on the sofa. Um, so back to the room and the actual construction in space. Oh, um, of the actual project which happened, which started to happen just before the end of last term. Uh, here's the chandelier in space, the ceiling. The original structure was intended to be a catenary, sort of tensile, absolutely insane. How on earth could we do that with brickwork? So we quickly discovered uh, in chatting with Ben Godber from Expedition Engineering that we'd probably be looking at bowstring trusses. Um, those bowstrings, we were very optimistic uh, in steel, would be extremely thin and then slowly, time after a little bit, you know, it took a little bit of time, but we discovered that sort of 15 mil would become 20, would become 25, would become 30, would become 50, would, you know, everything multiplied in this project. It's fantastic spawning mechanism. We have to patent it, but uh, anyway, the, the, the width of the structure also spawned magnificently. So we ended up getting um, posi joists, which are 250 mil deep uh, pieces of pine, um, not, you know, very narrow little bowstrings as we thought. Actually, this worked out brilliantly because we, we kind of never really done an analysis on this of how heavy the cable would be and how we would stow it. We always thought we'd sort of clip it onto the back of the panels, but in a way, this is like a pre-made shelving system just up there. So uh, these are the joists coming up into position. This is what we started to do with that space. We started to kind of install it with all our kind of props 
front window you see how wonky it is with our kind of rectangular structure going around it the structural diagram the ceiling panel diagrams with a sort of little collar for the necklace you know to make it feel comfortable uh, the little speckles of lights that fall through it and then this abstract plan that you'll see cnc would out of the ceiling panels uh, for the thing itself this is referred to in the handout the scaling that actually happens in the project so if you've got the aa up at the top there then you're squeezing that at one to six down into the middle plan. So what you see, I don't know if the mouse is going to work here. That little square there is then referenced to this square here. This square here is actually the size of the handout that you could grab upstairs in that little round table. And that's that thing there. And you can't really see, but this guy here with a little cross on his head, because of course he's a victim of surveillance, is standing just here or also just out here. So all of these things cohere in that sort of scalar system of one to six. So the kind of lonely little panels, just kind of so unaware of what was about to happen to them, <laughs> just sitting there, so peaceful, so calm. Uh, the starting of uh, erection onto the positive joists around the chandelier, spreading the mirrored panels across the whole ceiling. We then, of course, had to start to open them up, to start to put the dimmers in them. Um, now, I don't know much really about um, electronics in the slightest. Uh, I was always just thinking that we could just basically have a PIR and just attach it to a light and that was it really, you know, it could be, might be quite long, you know, and I quite like the cleanliness and simplicity of this diagram from Steve, which was kind of reassuring. Um, but we, we kind of ended up, we, we gave up drawing this thing after a while because it was just too frightening, the kind of amount of sort of switches and relays. So this is just a hint back in December. I mean, the question marks are kind of indicative, really. Uh, this is often a sketch of the kind of sequence that started to build up of the whole system, uh, from sensors to processing to Varus's display, what kind of signal they'd be sending out, how that would then be running the drivers to the dimmers. Here's Lawrence at work. So just, I mean, just to kind of give you a sense of kind of how things are simultaneously happening, because we're not all in the same boat, kind of rowing along together. Lawrence is busy working on the network while Carsten is kind of on uh, in the computer space trying to dissect the cameras while Steve is in this blissful heaven somewhere in Austria <laughs> <laughs> bathed in I know it's cool but you know he looks great and so happy so <laughs> he was lucky to be in Austria so here's kind of <laughs> here are the boxes starting to arrive and uh, these things are just looking, you know, sweet. They look nice, uh, but they're going to take a huge amount of effort. They start to look a bit military. Uh, they start to look a bit of an affront. They demand, they sort of stand to attention. So we spend a week, yes, and he's there collapsing on the first day already, uh, trying to kind of wire these things together. We have a lot of this stuff on the floor, a lot of kind of debris, which is lovely. And we're just trying to put these pieces together. We have two sets of dimmers for every lighting circuit. Uh, every lighting circuit's maximum of 18 LED, sometimes only three. So if you can imagine, you know, 1,027 divided by three or 18, it just becomes quite a lot. Uh, 96 pairs in total. This woman is from heaven. Her name is Kyo, and she is amazing. Um, I, she can do everything. Uh, no one should cease to employ her. I mean, you guys should be begging. I don't know if she's here now, but she is incredible, and I owe her massive gratitude. She did an amazing job here. Here she is tackling uh, one of the nightmares. I mean, there was a nightmare every day. It was quite interesting that God could kind of do this. It was very inventive. Every day was massively different. Every task was new. Every It was Herculean. It was really like... I, I, but I was good at it yesterday. Why can't I do that again? Why does it have to be a new one? So this was the day when we discovered the printer cable, which has got 25 cores inside of it, which was going to send out the lighting signal, or DMX, um, was not just kind of stranded parallel, but was woven together like some fiendish, viscous substance from a Greek myth or something. The idea that we had to kind of unravel six meters of this stuff, I mean, it probably you probably think that's easy, but I would just go and get a cable now, try it at home, because it's really fucking impossible. And to do loads of that, we spent days sweating, really. The forehead pores enlarged so much, it was incredible. So just some images of just of trying to recuperate a beauty from it somehow. Just There must be something redemptive in this process. Um, so this, at the same time, a lot of drawing was having to take place. Um, there was obviously the constraints on the ceiling panels of 
where all the holes are for all the lights. The dimmers had to be fitting between the lights, so there was this very weird kind of refurbishment of this kind of virtual space. We were trying to put all the various pieces of equipment upstairs in this seating. It started to generate fairly complex patterns. What you see here, the four boxes are the four uh, DMUX units, which are getting feed from Pharos's little brain, which is just there which is feeding off of the network right here. So it's sending signals to these four boxes, which are then sending a uh, series of, uh, well, four hubs of DMX. These are the electrical drivers. These are the zones of all the circuits, uh, which are being fed by each dimmer pack in the ceiling from basement ground, uh, first, second, third, and just some details of the kind of nightmare that I created for us in making these drawings. Uh, the general holes uh, in the ceiling versus the actual direct networks and then all the stuff kind of feeding together. So we had to kind of translate this onto the back of panels. Uh, we started drawing, so this actually was exactly what we'd done last year with our first year students where we drew a kind of scale map at the correct orientation of Regent's Park. Um, which we then, in a way, it just reminded me again of our the, the way that they were always kind of working on this ground surface. The final exhibition was this sort of attempt to curate a ground surface into something which could archive all of their work. So here we were on our knees all the time, mapping out all of those drawings into onto the CNC panels between the dimmers, trying to draw all those various networks, our own tracings in a way somehow echoing the kind of tracings on the ceiling already there, and kind of started to look again at all this stuff that had always been ignored, all these people at work, you know, or fainting, kind of like that guy when he was wiring the dimmers the first day, <laughs> looking in shock at this horrible thing, <laughs> you know. And I loved the kind of idea of this sort of tracery, this sort of the old and the new there, the kind of electronic and the plastered. So we spent a lot of time up there, you know, faceless, kind of hidden in panels, uh, hovering on one or two legs uh, up between these louvers, which would eventually fold shut. A lot of people told us we shouldn't, kind of, they liked them like this. Uh, but no one fell, it was great. Uh, so uh, we gradually increased the kind of growth of coils uh, and uh, occupancy of these spaces. You, here's us adding the DMX channels, the various dimmers. Um, this is the lads during the day and stuff gets increasingly more nested while uh, machines are having a good time in Austria kind of creating a stack about this high of Perspex panels which arrived at the beginning of, uh, I can't remember anymore, last week or something, uh, all padded out. That's the diffusers which we all brought in and the problem we had with the diffusers is that we couldn't actually get it to work to laser cut the identity of the diffusers on them, which was a bit of a crucial problem because it's not just 1,027 lights, but there's two bits per light, so 2,100 faceless, I absolutely different, in you know, indistinguishable shapes. So we had to... <laughs> uh, start to dissect all of those panels and take out all the text and then actually rub it on by hand. So <laughs> here we were. There was a lot of hand crafting for such a digital project. It was interesting. Uh, so we occupied a lot, a lot of spaces. What was interesting is that with that cardboard project, I actually occupied that front member's room for a while with the storage of all those units before they then get compacted back together. So here, this project greedily took over this room. It took over the entire room, and then at the end of the day, we were gone. There's Kyo bravely battling like eight panels by herself. <laughs> she absolutely magnificent, pulling all the pieces out, growing them, putting them together. It was quite a task to try and find all the pieces and kind of put them in the correct boxes for all the various panels that they would actually come out of. So you can see the sort of spawning gets really... <laughs> it, it was interesting that when I started speaking about this project, a lot of people started feeling uncomfortable. You know, as I was kind of going through the whole process, a lot of people were very generous suddenly to me. You know, a lot wanted to give me money or help or, you know, could I, I could sit down, I could lie down if I needed to. And, and that was the same for a lot of people. It's quite nice to see people having <laughs> similar pitying instincts here. So as we were assembling this, we were leaving little traces, not just of pity, but of kind of plastic uh, around the school, these kind of little bits of debris, the sheaths, kind of like snakeskin. So uh, the LEDs arrived, which was great, the, with the heat sinks. Um, and we had to go to work <laughs> getting them. So, you know, this is just gives you a sense of, like, the kind of growth that we had to go through. <laughs> uh, again, it looks very female, this team. I guess maybe, you know, that's the attribution of tasks occasionally. Uh, and it's like knitting, I suppose. But one of the crazy, crazy uh, things we had to do here was that there was a little... Um, 
O-ring which held the top of this diffuser together, and it was about, it's, uh, it's smaller than a nail, really, and uh, it, that had to be passed down the length of each one of these cables, which is seven meters, and that's 1,027. So that little ring had to go for a walk for eight kilometers, basically, just be kind of hand-threaded. And uh, when these LEDs first arrived, it was, it was kind of comforting because there's been a lot of weight and mass and volume to this thing. There's been a lot of stuff somehow. And they arrived in this beautiful little packet about this big. And it was amazing because I just didn't know you could compact seven and a half kilometers of cable into this. And I was like, that's beautiful cable. It must be so fine, like fishing wire, you know, wonderful. And of course, the cable wasn't in there. So we were suddenly thinking when we open these up, you know, there's 1,027 LEDs. They each need to have a bridge soldered to them. They have four soldering points. I'm just thinking through like, okay, so if you've got to solder, you've got to measure the cable. So a guy has just physically got to walk like a minimum of eight kilometers just to cut the cable, you know, just to kind of carry it back and forth. You know, so you, eight kilometers takes you like two hours just to walk it. That's not even allowed to cut it. You know, so if you ran and then you kind of cut it while you walked, maybe you could do that in two hours just to cut the stuff. That's before you even start soldering. So Vanessa has horror stories about how this kind of this calculation insanity that started to take grip about like, okay, so if it takes two seconds rather than one second, that means one and a half days instead of three days. So we can do that. So you've got to do it in two, you can't do it two seconds, it's got to be one second. And that was kind of the way it had to be uh, calculated. So there's poor Vanessa <laughs> kind of looking like she'd rather stay on the ground. Thanks very much, <laughs> even though the cable is behind, behind you. Uh, so that stuff had to go up in the panels as well. You can see we're not electricians, right? I mean, <laughs> there's no tidiness at all to this. And it, I, I love it, of course. I kind of, I love the English garden, the kind of unruly chaos, weeds. That's, it's great weed stuff. Uh, it looks, it looked so completely shockingly minimal once we closed it all up. It was kind of a shame. So uh, people came by. In fact, this was really, I love this coincidence because these guys are from this place, this guy. You know, in the evening, kind of skiving off work. Can you believe it to come in? You know, I love the idea that they're working on circuitry for things that look, you know, in the day they work on buildings that look like circuits, and at night they actually work on circuits. Uh, and there was all this kind of phantasmagoric uh, activity going on there. Very strange spaces were created. Um, here the lights are starting to hang down in preparation before we actually start to fold them up. What was amazing is that we created these alleys between the panels that we discovered actually fitted a ladder perfectly so we could kind of go down, it was just kind of like a little urban grid. Um, but then we also had this kind of huge monster scaffold that was the easiest thing to work on, which we had to kind of sweep through it occasionally as well. So it was a tough task. Anyway, I'm pretty boring you to death with all the kind of torture that we went through. So I kind of try and skip through and just get you a sense of all the kind of clutter. That was the joist. So you can see the kind of usefulness of all this pine work here to actually collect all our tresses. And I'd love this kind of shadow play, the lights projecting their kind of own existence, their own infrastructure back onto the traces on the ceiling itself. So here we are, we have lights finally, and they're you know, behaving very kind of um, unpredictably. I mean, I, the cable, you know, it would be lovely if it would just be straight, of course, you know, like cable <laughs> always would be, but in a way I find it really interesting, the kind of different ways that, you know, if it's kind of here, luminescent white stripes, and then here suddenly it's black stripes, and then here it's just disappeared. Sort of strange tricks of the light that you get with this stuff. It kind of, it contributed its kind of own amazing quality. That's actually the computer room that you're seeing there. This kind of strata of lights higher up, and then this kind of little field cluster of kind of monitors, that's actually the room that we're in now, that's the lecture hall, the ceiling. And that's the room itself, that's the sort of 12 chandelier pieces clustered together with their own new kind of re-reading. So just a few shots of the light, I mean there you get a sense of how delicately the kind of text is applied to the very tip of the plastic just above the heat sink. The heat sink's there to distribute the heat away from the LED, which is shining through the diffuser. And of course the walls were kind of playing with this suddenly where proximity mattered and then the reflections of the windows started to add and here's a few really drunken blurry shots from outside. And then of course it was not working on that opening night which was just completely devastating but at the same time in another way it had a different kind of effect you know. Uh, and what's interesting is that if there's always been this kind of joyous contamination if people have always kind of gone through and cabled it their own way or they kind of drew the diffusers their own way kind of thing they kind of intervened and kind of contributed somehow they made it they massaged it 
in a funny way, all these lights, uh, sort of uh, correct angles, kind of, uh, or mostly as much as we could do in the time, uh, they, they've kind of started to distort a little bit and kind of get reconfigured, you know, a little interrogatory yank here and there kind of has kind of slightly lowered the ceiling plane of this room or this one has sort of married this one elsewhere. So it's become... I, in, in, instead of the kind of true reading of the network, a little bit of a kind of more toyish interactivity has kind of been enjoyable. Um, so what we're waiting for right now, and uh, I have a web address but I'm not going to log on to it. I sense my time is up, uh, so I'm not going to show you all the rest of the stuff I was planning to. These are just some of the kind of playback scenarios to show the occupancy of the building. Uh, there was an intention, it's in the kind of literature, to have the website which is a like everything in gestation, um, interactive so that you could scan over the plans. This is, you know, plans as piano. You could skim across and you could activate the thing so that every 59th minute you could actually play the school, kind of. You could intervene, you could break in with your laptop kind of thing without even being in. Um, but there is a website which apparently is reading the network once the network is up. Uh, there's, there's a website anyway, but there's a website which is actually reading the log, which is the crucial thing about telling us information about what's going on in the school. So it's not, if we, it, obviously if it's all real time and just fritters away, like a CCTV tape without record, how pointless kind of thing. So there's the log for us to be able to replay once an hour, but it's just getting there slowly. And the idea was that you could see the lights live on the actual website, as well as the actual trajectory of time. So this is a sort of dissected floor plate. And then that kind of thing there is the idea of the shape of time that the everyone has made in this space. In being there, creating light in that space, they've also contributed to somehow an overall sense of how we all bind together. Last slide, I want to thank everyone for all their massive help on the project and thanking you for being so patient. I think, as Simon just said, it's almost too soon to be looking at these pictures. <laughs> um, we also should say thank you to Alex's mum, who appeared calmly on several days with strawberries, which was, which was very welcome. But does anyone, I don't know if there's anything else anyone can say or ask, but if anyone's got any questions now, Alex would be happy to answer some questions about the project. Anybody? No. <laughs> Uh, a sense of, uh, you know, per per perpetual catatonic crisis <laughs> is, you know, it's just, like it's just like every day <laughs> for you. And, but I'm kind of wondering if, you know, and it's one of these if questions, like, if you knew back like a year ago or whatever, would you, <laughs> no? I'll probably do it again because I just won't think it'll be as bad next time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think I'll have learned somehow. Yeah. But somehow you don't learn. Though, do I you? know. It's ridiculous. <laughs> That's why I teach because I can't learn. Hiroshima, <laughs> is this turning into kind of therapy? <laughs> <laughs> I felt, I think the lecture was a kind of therapy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. in, in a way, you know, and uh, I think a lot of people in the room did go through it with you and probably <laughs> it was probably too very incredibly close to the burn. And those of us who didn't go through it, I think we all feel like we've gone through it <laughs> now, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's also in the way you speak, you know. I mean, th there are no pauses. There are no, uh, you never take a breath. It's like this, 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 this. And the kind of relentlessness Sorry. is both, no, it's, I mean, it's extraordinary, but it's also incredibly exhausting. I, ju I just, I have no idea how, how you are, how, what it is to be Alex Hoare. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> How do you, I don't know. I think actually Michael Gondry is making a film about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. I think, I mean, the great thing about the lecture tonight, I think, was just the kind of celebration as well of everybody that worked on it. Because it was a cast of thousands, mm -hmm. Terry, speaking for you. And that was, that was what's really nice tonight, is just to hear that kind of input, unfortunate choice of word maybe, but just for the project, it was so complica complicated in terms of people working on it, but... But great, that first meeting when everyone sat together and just kind of had this whole kind of discussion about the technology involved was just, that was amazing. But we should have said stop then, I think. <laughs> well, maybe one, just to finish the question then. How do you feel about, because one, one goes upstairs to the installation, it's, 
it's perversely sim simple yeah. looking, yeah, yeah. you know? So all of this, mm. all of this blood, sweat and tears, mm. it's nowhere to be seen. And mm. in a sense, without you giving us the full exposition, mm. one can kind of go in and say it's a mm. series of, you know, it's funny shaped it. lights yeah, that yeah. make it, you know, sort yeah. of Zvorovsky-esque chandelier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, no, it's totally gutting. I mean, uh, you know, like, <laughs> that's like she said, <laughs> you know, the idea that it's a structure somehow is just absurd, you know. I mean, you, there are other ways of, you know, what's well, the point of wiring up a structure for no point at all? No, I mean, it's, it's really hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday there was a moment when they said, you know, we may never get this working and really, you know, those words were heavy. They were made of a kind of density of mass that I have not ever experienced in lead or steel. No, that was really rough. But I mean, it's really interesting that you just, you, I mean, you come up against obstacles that are unforeseen for everyone because obviously I don't know enough about all uh, the range of stuff, no one really knows enough about the kind of other stuff too. But what's interesting is to get communal kind of hitting like, oh my God, w w I don't know how to solve this. It becomes mystical. I mean, on Friday night, it was interesting because the, the network was down. So I'm going to bring, bring, uh, blame the building because it, it is actually the building that's getting in our way. The building won't let us know what it is which is, of course, a human condition, but the building won't tell us what's happening, that we can't get access to the network. But on Friday, when the opening happened, we couldn't, the, eth the ethernet wasn't giving us feed, we tried to copy something across it, it crashed the lighting playback controller, and half the lights went off, and half of them stayed on. And we got the loan, very generously, from Avalites of some very ancient equipment that really almost didn't work at all, like tanks kind of thing. And somehow this held the lights on when they shouldn't have been on. And the guys were looking at each other like this is an act of God. And it just reminded me of Einstein, you know, the way that he talks about the great one. It was just, it's bizarre for all this kind of insightful genius. There's just a sort of perverse mysticism behind everything about, I don't know how the fuck that works. <laughs> it's just happening. And it was there hanging by a thread, you know, everything. I mean, if you think about the potential for error here, it's just hugely, hugely painfully massive. Every, you know, the amount of authors here is insane, contributing and handing on every little junction. There's very little errors that actually um, took place. It's the fucking building that's the error. That's the insanity of it all, you know. Why, why did I give myself up to this building? I don't know. Anyway. Sorry, I didn't say that really. <laughs> Not being one of the cast of thousands and just coming to actually look at this exhibition because I wanted to see uh, the kind of work that Alex does. Um, you mentioned the word animation a few times and there's meta levels of animation going on here and I'm just, just from where I come from, what my interest is and I suppose the interest that we share, I'd be interested if you want to extrapolate it all on almost different levels and how it maybe relates to the soul of this building. Sorry to bring up the cliche of mm. drama, right? Mm. But just in terms of also, because I think a lot of this must feed into your teaching and mm. into your students and have a, a great effect, impact on people. And what we've talked about, um, some not, not very much, but is in how animation figures in that, mm. both virtually <coughs> and the web, and also this idea of chance that you're talking about and the mis liberation of the mistake, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Control. Wow, what a huge question. That's a brilliant question. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. is yours. Great question. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm really opposed to this idea of architecture as the monument, the sort of static sculptural form. And I, I suppose in a funny way, that's what binds a lot of people here in this space together is the sort of belief in dynamic systems and landscapes and, and stuff. And um, I think, I suppose... In essence, I, I kind of love forces, I love flux, I'm kind of addicted to movement and change, but I obviously am kind of deeply um, uh, kind of vulnerable to the kind of change that people will bring to A, this project, but B, architecture in general, that, that everything is always contingent, nothing is controllable, that there's always this hubristic, like this project, could there be anything more hubristic somehow than do an installation in a whole bloody building? You know, five addresses, how can you do that? It's impossible. So arrogant to control everyone, you know, ridiculous. Uh, there's always this urge to control and to put things in order and to keep them at bay, and at the same time, there's always this sense that they're always in flux and that they can never obey. And it's always, and that's the, the beauty, I think, of architecture as opposed to art, which gets pristinely hygienic 
clinically embalmed in the kind of gallery in, in the white space, you know, with the medical latex gloves perfectly positioned, nothing can touch it, don't breathe, you know. Um, that there's always animation and that comes from people and uh, there's the other obsession about the climate the, all these different bodies you know the solar body the earth body the human body kind of colliding I don't know if that answers your question at all so yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> can I ask one last because oh, you don't um, you don't actually te technically refer or use the word technology throughout. And there's, there seems to be kind of a, 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 a weird relationship to it. Because on the one hand, the, the, the project is, uh, you know, it, it sort of attests to a kind of like utopian technophilia. Uh, no? Like, uh, and, but then at the same time, you know, the, the whole exposition of your lecture is this technophilia, this love of or fascination for, you know, kind of tech technology literally comes back to make your life all of your lives fucking hell you know and uh, and there's also there's the, the ridiculousness of on the one hand computer le you know uh, laser cut kind of machine technology and then Kyo or, or Simon or whoever spent literally spending hundreds if not thousands of man hours always yeah you know and I'm wondering where because it's it's I mean are you really not is, is that an, uh, the ambiguity uh, reflective of your kind of ambivalence towards technology. I mean, are you no, on I'm one just hand really shit at technology, with it, and then on the other hand, completely against it. No, I'm completely for it. I mean, you know, the the answer is obviously well. If I was technically more competent, or we all were, or all this stuff was working together, then it would have required less hand effort. But in the end, someone's always got to wire the cables, haven't they? Unless a machine is imprinting the the, the sort of circuitry. So uh, I have a completely utopian belief in. Technology. I mean, I think architecture is technology, um, and I wish that we could have got it to have worked better. I I don't have a kind of romanticism about the suffering of the the hand or the labour. I, I thought it was interesting anecdotally as a kind of critic, you know, uh, culturally. I thought it was interesting sort of anecdotally, but not not for a project really particularly. Yeah. 